we're back. We're live. It's 11 o'clock rock here on a given Friday. And we have we have Dave Heenan with us. Dave Heenan, the word rolls off. You're talking like a magic word, <laughs> mystical magic word. He's here. He's here with us. Take a quick shot. There's Dave. Thank you. Okay, Dave. Uh, Dave, uh, he's a trustee of the estate of uh, James Campbell, one of the nation's largest landowners. Uh, he's a visiting professor at Georgetown University, at least for now. Uh, he what did serve, and I knew him then, as chairman and CEO of Theo H. Davies & Co. for several years. Um, and that's the North American uh, holding company for the Hong Kong-based multinational Jardine Matheson. And uh, he's been vice president for academic affairs at UH, and he was the dean of the business school, and I don't know what else. It takes too long to read all no, this. I'm also a notary public. Notary public. If you have any notary public work, <laughs> <laughs> they always you always forget. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and he's a writer, and he writes, and you know that when you were a writer, you know you speak like a writer. <laughs> Writers are different than regular people. Yeah. So, and he's written a number of books. I want to just tick some of them off. Uh, the one we're talking about today is Hidden Heroes: uh, Finding Success in the Shadows. Just just rolling out now. In fact, book signing last night. Last night at yeah. uh, Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Barnes and Noble book is just out. Yeah, literally. Great, and here it is, and I have a copy, believe it or not. And uh, also by Dave Heenan, Leaving on Top. You've heard of some of these. Bright Triumphs from Dark Hours about business. It's about business. Flight Capital, Leadership, Double Lives, Co Leaders, uh, The New Corporate Frontier, and Reunited States of America, which discusses, among other things, the draft. One of my favorite subjects. There you go. Yeah. Sure, National yeah. Service. Yeah. yeah. But before we talk about this book and the amazing points in it. I need to talk about the marathon, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're filming on sort of the marathon Sunday almost. And uh, for years, you and I both ran together. I, I think I outdid you. I did 13 here and two in Philadelphia. <laughs> wow. But after I quit, uh, we, we happened to live in a company-provided house on Cahal Avenue at, at around the 23-mile point. Uh, and because Theo Davies was the largest seller of Budweiser through its Pizza Hut franchise, we were able to abscond three kegs every year <laughs> and we've essentially dis dis uh, buted or distributed uh, free beer uh, on the course of the marathon. Three kegs, which was just a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, For both the helpers and the receivers. And you were at the tail end of the route. That's right. They had to go down and across Diamond Head and all that down into Copyright right. yeah. Park. So they were pretty dehydrated by the time they got and, there. And you know, you've, you've done this. Your mouth feels like cardboard. And yeah. to have, have a, a beer, and it wasn't a big one, it was about that size, yeah. uh, is quite refreshing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know, the fast guys, you know, the world class marathoners, they whiz by you and look at you like you're a pervert. <laughs> you're <right. laughs> but our kind of runners, oh, you know, yeah. so there is a god, there is a god, <laughs> right. and they knock them back quite, quite nicely. <laughs> you know, um, in those days, I ran once in London. Oh my goodness! And in yeah. London, it was really quite remarkable. Yeah. Um, I thought it was it was fabulous. Uh, there was th things that were so different from running in the U.S. I mean, one, for example, if you needed to uh, take a leak, you know, yeah. you did it where you stood, <laughs> right. including the women. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, there, was, there was this uh, extraordinary thing about the pubs. You know, it was like 7 o'clock in the morning. All the sure. pubs are open. Yeah, God bless them. <laughs> right. They must have talked to you because yeah. they were handing out beer, these big steins. Oh, well, you wow. know, my dad was a bartender, actually, an <laughs> Irish bartender. As you might so, you know, I go, well, beer and I go back a long way. Yeah. We must be related. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, How about cob cobblestones in London? Did, did, was, was that part of the problem? That's part I've of my heard, story there, yeah. I've, I've heard that, you know, in Europe, uh, a lot of the courses have are well, tough because of the cobblestones. Yes, yeah, true. And yeah. I, they had red, red carpet throughout the whole 26-mile course. <laughs> However, if you, if you were slower than a certain speed, yeah. they'd be pulling up the carpet in front of you. So <laughs> you had to run on what was underneath, which was the cobblestones. And I rem I'm glad you raised that because yeah. I, I think I still have injuries from the cobblestones. Yeah, no, no, a lot of people have problems with that. <laughs> So let's talk about your book for a minute, and I want to tell you what I was thinking on the way in. Yeah. I'm talking about hidden heroes. Right. I'm talking about heroes, and, and there's a disconnect for me. Um, because the, the hidden heroes you're talking about in this book, and we'll get into greater detail about it, are you know, people in the shadows by, by the tagline. Right. And, and uh, the understood. But the, the problem is that usually a hero is somebody known, somebody yeah. well-known, somebody who is and following the thread of all your books, right. leadership in a leadership position. So how can you be a leader and hidden? Does that work? Is 
disconnect for me. Well, it's, this is less on the leadership side. I mean, we live in a star-struck society, and we worship our heroes, whether they're astronauts, uh, CEOs, or whatever. So accordingly, people like Richard Branson and Elon Musk and Bill Gates are treated in a very, very special way. Yet in our heart of hearts, we know the real work, the heavy lifting, is not done by a few organizational gods, the great man or the great woman. It's done by exceptional subordinates, people who fly under the radar. And that's the gang uh, that I'm talking about. I think Will Rogers had that great set, uh, line. He said, there aren't many heroes out there. The few of them that there are out there. Uh, that we clap as they come by on the, on the street, but uh, it's a limited pool of people. But these, these folks are essentially people who are selfless, uh, they're egoless, they give up themselves, they take their careers, their ambitions, their lives half a step backward to propel someone or something a giant step forward. Mm. Why do you write your books? You've written, what, nine of them already? Ten. Ten, sorry. Actually, Who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> now, why do you write these books? I mean, you don't, you don't have to. You can spend more time teaching, what have you, yeah. uh, business in general, but you write books. Why? Well, early on, I was in a publisher parish world. I was, you know, as a business school professor, and to get tenure, you know, you got to crank it out. Of course, that stuff tends to be terribly dry, very, very analytical, a lot of quantitative stuff. Not terribly readable. Once I got into particularly leadership roles, I found out that it was a hell of a lot more fun to write uh, stuff that's more meaningful, more hard-hitting, uh, more in touch with contemporary times. And, and it's, so it's, Jay, it's like exercise. I mean, I, I typically write from 5.30 to, to 6.30, uh, 7 o'clock sometimes, every morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, Saturday I'll go from 6 to 10, Sunday I lay off. But it, it's just part of the routine. And when you get into it, and I, I, try, to do, I try to do anywhere from two to 400 words a day, preferably 400, all of a sudden it adds up and you've got a 60,000, 70,000 uh, word product. It initially looks like junk, <laughs> but uh, you've at least got something on paper that you can work with. Do you, do you have the voice initially? I mean, does the, do the words just spill out, or do you have to craft them even from the outset? No, you, you have to craft them. I mean, most of my books, I can tell you, that I've gone through them, I've edited them seven or eight, nine, ten times. And that's really the fun, is the, the tough part is getting that first product out, and it always looks terrible. I mean, you, you, the next day you look at it and say, how could I have written this stuff? <laughs> But then you, the beer. Th yeah, th there you go. <laughs> but then the craft of writing comes in, and you start to rephrase things and retinker things, and that's really the joy of putting a, a book together. Poetry. Yeah, poetry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So how did? Why did you write this book? Because this book's a little different than some of your earlier books. Yeah, this book, in many respects, is a sequel to the co-leaders book. Uh, the co-leaders book, you recall, was entitled Second Bananas. Again, publishers didn't like that, so uh, with the help actually of Spencer Johnson here in Hawaii, you know, Who Moves My Cheese, he actually came up with the title, and publishers love that title. I wrote, I co-wrote that book with Warren Bennis, yes. great leadership guy, yes. who died about a year and a half ago. But that book, as this one, was a frontal assault on the celebrity CEO, whether they're business, government, the military, what have you. Uh, who is presented, again, as the great man or the great woman surrounded by a pack of docile pygmies. Uh, <laughs> this suggested that there's a broader group of folks out there in that book, the number twos, that in many cases were as gifted, if not more gifted, than the more celebrated number one. Yeah. A lot of, uh, that book by far was my, our best seller. Ah, and a number of people, including the publisher, said, you ought to take it down. Uh, a couple of three levels in, in organizational life, and, uh, and and that's what this book ah. endeavors to do. So you you know in the in the in the, in the book um, um, co-leaders with Bennis. Yeah. The I, I think in terms of the appeal in the marketplace, right. a lot of people don't see themselves as leaders. Right. But they could see themselves as co-leaders. Right. So you're appealing to them, and now. You know, with with uh, hidden heroes, right. you're what taking it down to a, another level in the corporate structure, and you're appealing yeah. to more people yeah. yet. And and Jane, not as with co-leaders, 
this is not a business business book. I mean, there are many people uh, in categories in, the, in, in this book and in, and in co-leaders that are way outside the world of business. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about sports, some of Sports, education, entertainment. You, uh, you have a table of contents here that's very provocative. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Okay, aside, aside from the, uh, the first in praise of go, uh, hidden heroes, which I guess this is sort of an introductory definitional right, sure, thing. Yeah. You have hoop dreams, that sounds like sports. You have football light, L-I-T-E, yeah. that sounds like sports. Supporting acts, yeah. what's that about? It's about uh, openers, backup singers, supporting stars ah. who uh, put their own careers uh, behind the scenes to prop up their more celebrated ah. headliners. Ah. Yeah. Find Ed McMahon. Yeah, no. I, as you may know, the, I did a book before uh, on, uh, on Leaving on Top. Yes. Where I compared Ed McMahon and Johnny Carson. You know, yes. Johnny got out on top, Ed got out an absolute a, basket a long case. Time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect gentlemen, I'm, I'm curious about Perfect that. Perfect gentlemen are who do you think is the most important personality on a luxury cruise ship? The, ca the captain, maybe, or? Social director. The social director, uh, the, the head chef. No, the most important stars, hidden heroes by far, are the revolving crew of uh, male dance hosts dedicated to women <laughs> oh, traveling course, alone. Of course, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> when you talk to far-sighted executives, particularly, and I'm talking the luxury segment, yeah. I'm talk talking the silver stars and the crystals and so forth, their number one clientele by far are older, <laughs> wealthier women who outnumber men four to one on those ships. <laughs> and over the years have found out that these ladies are no longer content to sail solo, nor are they content to play bridge and go to fashion shows around the swimming pool. They literally want to kick up their heels, and that means dance. And so, again, far-sighted cruise ships bring on a bunch of single men, typically b between 45 and, and 70, uh, to basically dance their their shoes off. <laughs> Maybe you can be an occupation for me. <laughs> well, you have to be to be. Well, you've got to be single and you've got to be proficient in six dance steps, yeah. major dance. Is steps. that right? <laughs> yeah. But you also have to be in damn good shape because, yeah. as you know, you've traveled. The gong goes off typically in one of the lounges at about ten in the morning, yeah. and it doesn't end until after <laughs> midnight. And the rule is you've got to be there for every dance, so uh, you don't want to be an old geezer running out of gas. But the good news is you don't have to sing. You don't have to sing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, halls uh, disposable dons. That's provocative. Disposable dons are the large cluster of adjunct faculty. These these are non tenure track professors uh, who teach now almost 65 percent of all the courses offered by our great universities. And they typically are way underpaid. Uh, they tend to be abused. They don't have office space. They don't have all the many faculty privileges. But they do the heavy lifting. And in terms of teacher evaluations, and there's been a lot of empirical work on that, they almost in every case outperform the permanent faculty. Uh, but they're, they're a group that literally is fighting for their lives because many of them uh, you know, have found that this is sort of a, a career to nowhere. Yeah, no tenure possible. No, no tenure, and the tenured faculty tend to be against them. Uh, they, have, uh, they have very little support groups, although most you'll find in many campuses now uh, these adjuncts have unionized. Uh, and they've also gotten some, co uh, some support in Congress. But they're a very, very interesting group of people yeah. that, that definitely are in the shadows. And they make it go around. They, they are make, the they, backbone. They really are the backbone. And, yeah. and, you know, they're part of the gig economy, which you know a lot about. <laughs> the gig economy on campus. <laughs> on campus. No, but you know, for university presidents and boards of region, if you want to slash salaries, I mean, if you want to... Uh, you know, save some bucks, you know, you let $125,000 full-time professor retire and you fill those classes with a couple of Joe Blows who were making 2500 bucks a course. So, I mean, the criticism has been adjunctivitis, which Paul Solomon uh, presented on PBS, yeah. where uh, in many cases either universities have overloaded on these folks, on the back of these people, 
or more importantly, they've just been woefully underpaid and undercompensated. So you see, this is not just about hidden heroes. It's about the system. It's about our society, the way things work, where right. you fit in, where you don't, where you can make a contribution or not. That's Dave Heenan, author, among other things. We'll be right back after this short break. Hello, my name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced attitude in life. Join me. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, and I'm inviting you to navigate the journey. We are discussing the end of life options and we would really love to have you every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. right here. Bingo. So we're going to talk about uh, a little further detail about hoop dreams. There you go. And, uh, you know, th this is interesting because when we talked last, we talked about leading on top. And in, in that case, um, you were out there engaging with people all over the country Correct. and beyond yeah. and talking with them, even visiting them, you know, sure. taking a trip yeah. and going to see them and trying to understand why they left on top or mm -hmm. didn't. Right. Uh, you know, and the educational value of that is huge for anybody reading the book. So did you follow the same pattern this time? I did, Jay, although that, that was more personality, people-driven. Uh, the chapters typically were about one or two people. Uh, these chapters tend to be about a cluster of people. I mean, there are tons of people uh, sprinkled in the chapters, but it's, it's less person-specific and more topic-specific. Uh, okay, what about hoop, hoop Dreams? Hoop Dreams is interesting. I mean, Hoop Dreams, uh, you know, uh, pro sports are all about victory, all about winning. You know, George Allen, uh, winning is everything. Uh, yet there's another group of people on the other side of the balance sheet, win-loss column, who are equally important. Those are the losers. Mm -hmm. And for 60, you can't have winners without losers. There you go. You can't. <laughs> and for 63 years, basketball's Washington Generals were hidden heroes. They were the losingest team in all-time sports history. Over the years, they've managed to lose 16,000 games, all to the same team, the Harlem Glo Globetrotters. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Going for a record. <laughs> these guys lost in front of popes and princes. They lost in front of kings they, and queens. They lost in front of Barack Obama and Nick, Nikita Khrushchev. They lost on aircraft carriers. They lost in bullfight rings. Perfect. They, they lost in empty swimming pools. The last time they won was January 5th, 1971, when their owner play a, co a coach, a guy named Red Klotz, who I interviewed, Red died two years ago at the age of 93, uh, managed to sink the winning shot uh, that, uh, that, uh, that took care of the game. Since that time, they never won another match. <laughs> but Klotz was always uh, circumspect about, about losing. He said, you know, there's, losing's just part of life. And he said, if you've tried hard and given it your best, uh, so what? It's how you play the game? It's how you play the game. Okay. And, and he also reminded me that winning's only important in two theaters, surgery and war. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in a lifetime, in 60 years, these guys, I mean, rem remarkable players, were the competitive counterweight to Abe Saperstein, the creator of the Harlem Glo Globetrotters in the 20s. Uh, you know, his famous all-black uh, traveling squad. They were great. They are great, yeah. But... Uh, uh, these guys, you know, when, when Red recruited players for the generals, uh, they had to play the role of the foil, the victim, the understudy. They could never upstage the fan favorite trotters. Yeah. These are guys that were going to have every, night after night their shorts pulled down, the ball put behind the back of their shirts. <laughs> shirts, by the way, Jay, with no names in the back. These guys, before, during, and after the game, were totally anonymous. Professional straight men. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and, and at the end of the game, they would sort of slither out a side door in the arena. <laughs> Perfect. Never to be heard from again until the next night when they lost another game. <laughs> yeah. 
And that, that, you know, that formula worked for years and years. I, I think you probably know in recent years, the Harlem Globetrotters have had some ups and downs. Yeah. They, they've survived two bankruptcies and a string of ownership changes. Yeah. Yeah. But all during this process, Red Klotz and the generals have been by their side. In fact, Red, on two well-documented occasions, bailed them out. Financially? Financially. Wow. Uh, interestingly, as, as a closer on this, uh, uh, after Red's death, the Harlem Globetrotters decided to name uh, their 2015 World Tour the Washington General's Revenge. And players on both teams had Red's initials on their jerseys. But only three months into the tour, the, the uh, ownership of the, uh, the Globetrotters had a change of heart and terminated the 63-year relationship. Oh, too bad. And people in the sports world and players on both teams, past and present, were shocked that this happened. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys I interviewed was Curly Neal. If you remember Curly, uh -huh. he's now in his 70s, but a longtime uh, Globetrotter, Globetrotter great. He said, you know, the Harlem Globetrotter's success, which is now in its 90th year, by the way, is every bit as much due to red clots and the Washington generals as it is their sure. own. And he said, don't ever call the generals losers or patsies. He said they weren't. They understood that one of the greatest joys we have in life is to put a smile on somebody's face. And at the end of our games, frankly, nobody knew the score. They yeah, only man, knew. They all had a good time. They all had a good time. <laughs> and, and so when the Washington generals lost, everyone won. Yeah. And that's really the, the essence of yeah. the good hidden hero. So it's not one person. It's not a one group. person. It's a group. Very important yeah. point. <clears throat> let's take another one uh, sure. that we hadn't mentioned. Uh, let's. I'm just uh, taking it by random, but underdogs of the air. What in the world is that underdogs about? Underdogs of the air are a very interesting group of, of guys. This is more historical. These, these are men and crew, 5,000 of them, who flew Navy blimps in World War II, derisively called poopy bags. <laughs> and gas bags. Uh, th these are guys you can imagine going through flight training at Pensacola and you're about to get commissioned and these guys go into fighter aircraft, these guys go into helicopters and, and you get orders to go to Lakehurst, New Jersey to be a blimp pilot. I mean this is not in terms of building a career in naval aviation where you wanted to go. But in World War II what had been a fairly deactivated, Roosevelt hated blimps. FDR. He never supported them. But as the war broke out, as an anti-submarine search and rescue, almost a C-130 sort of offshoot, uh, they recommissioned uh, the blimp gang and, and again produced 130 of these with a very large inventory of pilots and crew. And uh, yet, you know, through their careers, as you can imagine, a lot of people poke fun at them. Uh, but interestingly, Ad Ad Admiral Domitz of the German Tsar said at the end of the war, in terms of anti-submarine, they never sank a sub, but he said they dramatically changed uh, the flow and course of, of, of their travels and, and attacks. Mm -hmm. And many of the merchant marine folks that were picked up uh, always said, God bless our blimps. They, they, <laughs> right. were, they were first in their right. heart. Right, a perfect example. Perfect, yeah. But at the, end, at, the, at the end of the war, as nuclear subs came on board, as high-performance aircraft came on board, uh, from a budget standpoint, these guys were basically a goner. Yeah. And so in 1962, the last one was deflated. Uh, you can find it at Lakehurst Naval Air Station. All right, still yeah. today. Still today. Although the, the instrument, the blimp itself, is having sort of a renaissance in, in high-tech uh, terms of both manned and unmanned blimps that are, among other things, high-altitude, weather-seeking. Some of them are equivalent to drones, surveillance. Yeah, unmanned. Unmanned. Uh, some, some are manned. Uh, and, uh, you know, the advantage is you don't need an air, airstrip of any size for these things. Yeah. They have tremendous lift capacity. So transport in Alaska, and so they're doing a bunch of these things now, uh, they are having a resurgence. Without an airfield, sure, Alaska's yeah, perfect. Right, yeah. You know, it strikes me, uh, John Glenn died, and yeah. and now, you know, we, we sort of analyzing where he fit in the space uh, program back yeah. when. 
And it strikes me that for every John Glenn, right. there's a lot of hidden heroes yeah, around absolutely. him and under him. And that's another, I suppose, example of what you're talking about. You know, and Glenn would know it. I mean, just as an aside, I was going through Marine Corps officer training at Quantico, and they hauled all of us into a large theater one day. And that was the day that Glenn blasted off. And of course, he was at that point, he was a colonel, a Marine colonel. He, you know, he flew in Korea with the likes of Ted Williams and Jerry, remember Jerry Coleman? Mm -hmm. uh, another Yankee who later was a broadcaster. And so they had a, an incredible squadron. I, I knew, uh, in fact, in my squadron, we had a guy named Bud Yant, family of Yauntsville, who was also in that squadron. Uh, he had an amazing group, but, but uh, Glenn was the, in many respects, the essence of the Marine Corps, which is esprit de corps. And if you look at the Iwo Jima Memorial, in D.C. or any other place, you'll notice that all of those personalities are faceless. In fact, it's almost impossible to get any sort of facial recognition out of them. No general officers, no officers of any kind. And, and that's the kind of value system that the Marine Corps Semper Fi uh, tries to inculcate that, that really is, a, is, is an element of the ethos of John Glenn in his later, later life. Supporting the program. Supporting Not the needing program. or wanting to be recognized Absolutely. as a top hero. Yeah. I'm giving you your book. I'll sign it for you if you want. <laughs> but I'd like, I'd like you to pick a page and read us a paragraph just so we can feel the, uh, the beat of the, of the prose. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about this, Dave. <laughs> you didn't tell me. <laughs> you didn't <do> this. <laughs> Let's see. Pick I mean, this is, this is also good. Uh, that uh, here's, here's a local one that I hope doesn't shock anybody. Oh No was Reuben Ch Chong's street name, as in Oh No, here he comes. <laughs> For a decade, the homeless ex-convict prowled Honolulu's Chinatown in search of his support for, for drugs. Who could imagine that this 34-year-old st street smart thug would eventually find his footing at Leeward Community College, where he graduated as a straight-A student and student body president. He then went on to earn his bachelor's and master's degree at uh, UH Manoa. Nothing in Reuben Ch Chung's life came easily. Given up by his parents at birth, he was abandoned by his adoptive parents at age three. As a ward of the state, he shuttled between at least a dozen foster homes before fleeing an abusive father in the 11th grade. After a precarious year in the streets learning to survive, he joined the army where he stayed for almost six years. But when he got out, uh, he had developed a, br a, a drug problem, broken and, uh, and broken, with no family, family to call on. A demoralized Chong lived for 10 years on the streets, convicted of four felonies, and spent almost five years in prison. But it was there through a substance abuse program, uh, he got his life back and I'm just jumping here. After his release from prison, he enrolled at Leeward. And from there, uh, everything went up in the, in the right direction. I think I've got it, Dave. Yeah. What you're talking about is inspiration. Yeah. You know, you're at the core of you, you're a teacher, a leader, an inspirer. This book is about inspiration for all of us. That's what I think. I think so. I hope so, Jim. Thank you, Dave. Terrific. Thank you. Oh.